Hi everyone, I am Jamie Ludwig. I am co-chair for the science group of the YLC and I'm also an assistant professor at Ryder University in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. I'm joined by Sarah Creamer, who is the other co-chair of the science group and Sarah is now a staff research associate at um, the UCLA Department of Radiation Oncology. Sarah and I are joined by Dr. Ben Black, who is the Eldridge Reeves Johnson Foundation Professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics. Um, Dr. Black did his undergrad at Carleton College. He did a PhD at the University of Virginia on nuclear protein export. He also did a postdoc at um, UCSD, and now he is at Penn. So I thought we would start, Dr. Black, by just telling us a little bit about your research interests and how they led you to Penn, and now you're doing research that is supported by the Basser Center. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this in terms of, um, also in terms of the breast cancer connection. Um, and th those, those things go back to when I first wanted to be, you know, a biochemist or cell biologist, molecular biologist, was um, actually when, when I was in high school. So there was um, uh, Amgen is a big uh, biotech company now. It was a pretty small company then. And their first drug was Epigen. And they had a program with my high school. So we were, I got to go to the campus, uh, their research campus, and they had a lecture series. And I was really fascinated. Their, the first, this drug is, is a recombinant form of erythropoietin, which is, if you don't know it, is, it helps your, you make blood. And I, I wasn't putting it together exactly why you'd want to do that, right? Who would be, you know, maybe hemophiliacs or something like that. But one of the biggest things they were excited about, the scientists there were actually breast cancer patients, and specifically young breast cancer patients, because um, they, the treatment regimen at the time was to give aggressive uh, chemotherapy, radiation, um, and other approaches that were, um, and then keep the patients alive by doing a, um, a bone marrow transplant. And the younger the patients, the more aggressive they could go, but they still wanted to be more aggressive to try to extend these young women's lives further. Um, and they were, they were hardier individuals um, anyways, uh, because of their youth. And, um, and this drug could be taken to, to, to push it even farther. And so this was something they were really excited about. At the same time, when I was in high school, BRCA1 was discovered and it was big news. Um, and uh, then in college, BRCA1, and, when I was in college, BRCA1 and 2 were discovered and my genetics professor at Carleton was friends with some of the people in Washington who were doing the work in the lab anyways. And um, I, he had um, harrowing stories of how patient families were um, uh, calling the lab directly to ask if they were getting close to being able to do this diagnostic test because there were families that knew they, they um, had this, this, this familial uh, propensity to have uh, high incidence of breast cancer, but they didn't, you know, they didn't know if they were carriers, the young women, and they were considering prophylactic surgeries and other things like that. So I, I thought this was fascinating. And, you know, I thought about the discoveries that were being made by people that were, you know, doing the things that I thought were cool, biochemistry, molecular biology, genetics, um, molecular biology, as I mentioned. Yeah. And so I, when I was thinking about doing that, I wanted to be in sort of discovery science and I've always been interested in things like these BRCA proteins that were, you know, regulating the genome. Um, bound to our chrom chromosomes and doing something interesting there. So that's what I've been focused on since I was in graduate school, things like transcription factors, things that are controlling the fidelity of our, our, our the transmission of our chromosomes. And I had an opportunity to get in, in, involved with um, studies of this enzyme PARP1. At the time, it wasn't understood that it was going to be a, 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 a potential therapy for people with BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations. That came about later. But I just wanted to understand how the enzymes work. And when that came about, that PARP inhibitors were going to be a viable um, and an exciting avenue for, for treatment options, and, and we'd have FDA-approved drugs going into patients, um, then we all of a sudden were right in the thick of it. So that's sort of the trajectory that got me to, the, to um, where we are with that kind of work today. 
So you've been interested in um, helping out breast cancer patients since long before you really kind of got into your PhD work and all of that, and it kind of came full circle to bring you back here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm like uh, one of many people that you know are following their interests, but always trying to keep their nose on where they could could be in the position to make a difference. And it's not always linear, um, and especially when you're in discovery mode, you don't know. You know, it's a it's a a big abyss. Of unknowns, and uh, uh, but that's kind of where the excitement is because you can you can learn new things that, and you don't know what the connections will be yet. But um, but there's discovery there to be made. So definitely, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm, I'll I'll skip our next question because you already answered it perfectly okay. about the. BRCA1 and 2 okay. related cancers and how you got interested in those. Um, but the members of the YLC are also interested, we're interested in like clinical advances, but we also recognize that there are important breakthroughs at um, the basic research level. So can you explain how your research might lead to these future breakthroughs or how they're connected? Yeah, I'll, I'll try. Yeah, I mean, I think the the our recent study um, uh, that, that uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, I'm sure, um, which we're really excited about. You know, I think the, the main sort of thrust of it is that um, I think it, it helps with the realization that we might not have the best possible PARP inhibitor molecules in the clinic right now. Um, so we're, we're trying to help, you know, do our part to help discover and develop better ones and uh, use the methodologies, the sort of the experimental approaches that we developed uh, with our recent study to assess those new new compounds and molecules as they come out um, so that, that that by the time that they're actually potential drugs going into a patient we can predict what their behavior is going to be at the molecular level um, so the idea at the outset of our study was that you know for breast and ovarian um, um, a cancer uh, 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 was that the you know all these inhibitors would would inhibit PARP1, and they all bind to the same place on the enzyme. So the idea was that they should all act the same. That was the the idea. They should all they 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 have the same activity. They bind to the same place. Well, it was clear from the get go that this when they when these were put into patients that that wasn't what was happening. Some of them did you know were, were very efficacious and others weren't. And our study really provided a, an important piece to that puzzle by discovering how they direct different alterations of the, um, the enzyme itself, PARP1 itself, and how it interacts with our chromosomes. And the, 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 we didn't invent the term, but it's something um, called PARP trapping. Trapping PARP on the chromosome is, is something you want to do. It's very toxic to a cancer cell that you're trying to kill. Um, so now I think we know how to, to modulate that, and that will lead us and others uh, to, to um, developing new, new, new drugs. And um, some of these might do better, you know, depending on their properties, might do better on their own with what's called single agent treatment, and some might do better in different combinations. So that's, you know, I think where, um, where we're, we're trying to, to go with in, in, in sort of this particular realm, I say, would say in general, um, you know, your question alludes to, you know, um, uh, you know, I think the, the idea that, yes, it is really exciting um, to see translation of our current biological understanding, but the driving forth, forth, force in the lab, um, you know, is that new breakthroughs on the underlying bi biology and the molecules that are involved and breaking through technical barriers and new, kind, way, new ways to see things and new things, that has to be done because, um, they will form the basis of new medicines and, and new, new things to translate into the clinic that we can't yet imagine. And I think that leads us well into the next question. So the work that you're doing is going to allow for us to fine tune the types of PARP inhibitors that are being developed because now you understand better how PARP inhibitors can specifically lead to the, the trapping mechanism that you talked about and, and make for stronger chemotherapy drugs. With that, we also hear about chemotherapies leading to um, resistance yep. with patients and that um, they become less efficacious for patients. So the same work that you're doing, is that something that can ultimately lead us to developing chemotherapies that will maintain their activity for patients longer and, and be more successful in that way? 
Um, we hope so. I mean, I think that, you know, resistance is, is a, a very broad problem with the uh, treatment of, of cancer. So um, in a general sense, yes, PARP inhibitors are subject um, to this, but how they, you know, how, how you acquire resistance, uh, that could have to do with, you know, what goes on in an individual patient for sure, but it could also have to do with um, what kind of compounds you're using and what kind of treatment you're using. So um, if we could get better compounds, maybe we could get a more durable uh, response before there is the, the possibility of having um, uh, resistance. The other concept here is that, and this is not, a, not ours alone, but for, through the field is, you know, what's going to be the most important thing to pair up with PARP inhibitor treatment? So can you do, um, hit another pathway or, or impact the immune system? Or, or, and how would those things work with PARP inhibitors? And each one of these PARP inhibitors, because they have such different properties on the, on the enzyme and the outcome of what happens from just their use in the cell, there might be different um, properties that are, are, are um, better for this combination versus this combination. So th these things are gonna have to be looked at one at a time uh, very carefully. It's gonna take a, a, a lot of effort, more than my lab can do alone, but we can add Part of, the, part of the puzzle, and we've certainly already added the, the, uh, the technical wherewithal to do that, and we and other labs can, can copy what we did and, and be able to, to do this as well in their own, in their own groups. So um, that's how we're thinking of it. One of the, y'all mentioned, it, one of the, I think it's the first PARP resistance mutation from a patient, it was from an ovarian uh, cancer patient, um, in the UK who had uh, developed resistance to a laparib treatment, one of the PARP inhibitors that's widely used uh, as a frontline uh, uh, chemotherapeutic right now. And um, that mutant actually disrupted the connection in the molecule itself so it could no longer talk back from the, where the drugs bind to where the, it, the enzyme is trapped on the DNA. So we use that as part of our, that particular mutant we used in our study um, to help us understand the pathway. Um, and we don't know, these are probably, you know, these kind of mutations, uh, there's a variety of ways you can gain PARP resistance. So we don't know which ones are gonna do which, but we thought it was very intriguing that, that this pathway uh, was impacting exactly the kind of thing that we were finding at the high resolution molecular level. Thank you. Very interesting, thank you. Um, so in your science article, you talk about how PARP hyperactivity is linked to other diseases um, outside of cancer, such as cardiovascular disease. So do you think just um, that this could provide a link between BRCA mutations and increased risk of these diseases like cardiovascular disease? Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I mean, the, just to go over the general concept here, it's not very straightforward. You think one drug, right. one drug target, and you'd think, well, the outcome is going to be the same kind of thing. And in, in cancer, you're trying to do completely the opposite thing is in these, from these disorders where you have uh, hyperactivity. So in one case, in cancer, you're trying to um, uh, target the enzyme, trap it on the DNA, and kill the cancer cell. That becomes very toxic. Well, how could you rescue a cell that's having toxicity from something else? Well, it's, it's sort of the opposite effect you would want to inhibit the enzyme, but not trap it on the DNA, and, um, and keep that cell healthy because this PARP enzyme is, is um, being activated erroneously. This is happening in the nervous system in things like Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. It's happening in um, uh, some forms of cardiovascular disease, other forms of inflammation. So there's a lot of interest in these because these molecules are effective already and known, even though they're developed for cancer, they're very effective at inhibiting PARP1. They've been through safety trials in the clinic, so people understand them. So there's a lot of interest to see if you could get these into the clinic, but they're gonna have to have completely different properties. So the ones that are best at treating cancer might not be the best ones for treating uh, these other diseases. Now back to the idea of BRCA1 and 2. Now I don't know if, if, if that um, implies that they're, uh, if you have a BRCA1 and 2 um, uh, heterozygous mutation in your brain, in a neuron, if that's going to uh, affect how PARP1 is active or not. One thing I could think of is that these treatments for people uh, that have these diseases, they're going to be not short-term treatments, but long-term treatments. So these drugs have to be very non-toxic if they're going to work. 
they have to get into your brain. That's another challenge. And, um, and people with, the, with BRCA1 and 2 mutations might need to have uh, sort of a, a special treatment regimen because so their, their reaction to a PARP inhibitor and those and toxicities associated with it might be different. So it doesn't mean it's hopeless for them, but it means that maybe you need to have a more personalized kind of treatment and know what kind of inhibitor you're using and the, and the, and the properties of an inhibitor. So that's, that's sort of how I'm thinking of it. I, I, we'll see how it, how it goes. There's a lot of unknown uh, uh, aspects to even thinking about that. And, um, and these, these are just, I think, just starting to be thought of as clinical trial worthy studies. They've, there's a lot of proof of principle in animals uh, in animal models in the lab, but not in, in, in humans yet. I've read a bit about trying, seeing if there are links between the BRCA mutations and things like cardiovascular disease. It's something that my family, the same side of the family that carries the, the mutation also has lots of cardiovascular disease. So it's huh. like double whammy, but I've just been yeah. interested if there are links between the mutation yeah. and these other yeah. diseases. I'm, I'm, I, I, uh, I'm not, I'm, I, you know, you, I, I'm not an expert in, 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 in that aspect of those, those particular links, but it, now, now you've got me curious and I, I'll, I'll, tr I'll try to learn more about it. Okay, well, we're almost done with our questions. The last question that I had is kind of thinking towards the future. You've touched on, um, I think, personalized medicine quite a bit, that this, you know, the foundational research is going to lead us in the place that we can have much more personalized medicine. Um, so that may be what you see for the future. But my question is, where does the field go from here? And what do you think might be some of the biggest breakthroughs for yeah. BRCA related cancers in the next five years? Well, I mean, you know, with our sort of laser focused view of things, I think even back to what I sort of mentioned before is that they, uh, PARP inhibitors are exciting. They've, they've, they've done a lot of great things in the clinic already, but they haven't really in our, uh, lived up to their full potential. I think that's one of the most take home, that's the biggest sort of take home message from our recent study. Um, uh, you know, one can look at ovarian cancer where the, 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 um, the impact of PARP inhibitors can be more durable, uh, leading to progression free survival on a longer time scale. And breast cancer, it's been fairly modest. And so, one of my colleagues in this uh, center that um, we've started up, the Penn Center for Genome Integrity, which is um, uh, an offshoot of, of cancer biologists and, and, and from various uh, uh, backgrounds. Um, one of my colleagues is Elizabeth McDonald, and she's joining in our collaborative, collaborative effort on this project. And she's really convinced that PARP inhibitor approaches can be more tailor-made to specific patient genetic backgrounds. Um, new, new PARP inhibitor compounds could be developed to more effectively treat breast cancer. And that um, uh, potentiating PARP inhibitors or combining PARP inhibitors through more sophisticated treatments and imaging regimens can lead to a, a much greater success. So we want to do what we can to, you know, to, to help her. She's uh, in the clinic. She's doing imaging of, 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 of patient uh, uh, material and, and in patients. So we're excited about combining our efforts with, with that. And so I see, see some, you know, the combination of all those things and, and getting, you know, more information, the genetics, you know, imaging, trying to get more tailor-made uh, therapies. That's what, what you're alluding to. I think that's really exciting. Um, so, I, and I think, you know, the other thing is that I'm really excited about is there is a lot of new biology out there. There's, uh, you know, that, that's, that is, you know, just, you know, there's excitement about certain, you know, new pathways. Oh, we didn't even know that was there. And we can, there's a sensing mechanism for uh, DNA that happens when you have chromosome segregation errors in the tumors. And then your immune system can get activated by that. How does that all work? So I, you know, to, you know, I think the, you know, to get back to this question of, you know, where the biggest breakthroughs are, I think you know, breast cancer related breakthroughs that are, are, you know, are centered around the goal of how to most potently target PARP inhibitors. Um, that's, that's, you know, that's something where we, we really are, are excited about. And, um, and, and in new discoveries um, where, you know, thinking outside the box, uh, thinking about how we can, can do new, make new technologies. Part of the lab is trying to develop uh, designer chromosomes, or we call them artificial chromosomes in, in the lab. And we can do things with those uh, in this team of, of, of groups that we have that have different systems and animal models and cell-based models. 
and and deliver these and, and probe these these connections between the immune system and and um, and DNA damage, all these things that we're so excited about. And when we uncover those new biologies, I think then then there'll be the idea that oh, there's another way to attack this, or this would be the right uh, combination therapy, or there's a brand new target that we didn't even know about. And so and this is going to be really important uh, for for new new things that that could we bring to the clinic. So I think. You know, there's the, the the narrow focus of like, you know, we can improve these therapies and then there's the bigger focus. Let's discover new things. And then five or 10 years from now, we'll, we'll see what we'll be able to translate in the clinic. It's exciting to hear that there's collaboration of people with so many different backgrounds to tackle the problems because you know that that's how um, the biggest solutions are going to come about. So that's exciting. Yeah. I mean, Penn and the Basser Center are so well positioned because you know, we, we, and this little team, this team we have, uh, you know, we, we just started up and we have people from engineering, from the vet school, from the arts and sciences, from the, from the medical school, from children's hospital. And we are all within a five, 10 minute walk of each other. We could, you know, we, um, uh, we can come meet together in non COVID times, uh, uh, <laughs> very easily, as well as our teams. So we're talking about, you know, many teams of, you know, between, uh, you know, uh, maybe six to 20 people. And so it gets to be a large group of, of, of really smart people that I get to work with every day. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, makes it really fun to come to work and really exciting to think about where these things are headed, um, uh, you know, in the lab and in the clinic, um, you know, you know, in the next, in the coming year. Well, we appreciate your work, um, and it was really great to read the science paper. That was um, a very, very interesting paper. I just taught medicinal chemistry back in the oh. spring, um, okay. so I won't get a chance to teach it for probably a few semesters still, but that paper is on my list to include because it, it touches on so many things that I cover in that class, so um, oh, that's, great. That's great. that's a great read. Yeah. You know, and thank you guys for what you're doing. This is, uh, you know, excitement, exciting that you guys are expanding what your your uh, your your group is doing within the Basser Center and beyond. And um, and you know, uh, from the research side, it's really, you know, it, it's you know, I, I get tickled just thinking that that there, you know, you know, somebody cares uh, about this from uh, beyond the, my uh, my great colleagues in science. And uh, and so it, it's it's fun to see that. And you guys are doing really important work. Thank you. Thank All you, right. and thank you for joining us. Thanks.